Okay, so this is ECE641, and today I'm going to uh, finish up some of the Gibbs sampler material, and then maybe I'll cover a little bit on um, uh, Markov random fields, general Markov random fields, which is interesting material, I think. So um, let me switch over to the document camera. Okay. Okay, um, Okay. so so last time uh, we were talking about the Gibbs sampling algorithm, uh, uh, the Casey's Metropolis algorithm. So, um, so, you, so the basic algorithm is that you start off with some state X, right? And then you repeat and the repetition is that you first of all, you generate a sample W with some proposal distribution Q of W given X, right? And then what you do is you calculate uh, alpha of W X, okay? So this is the acceptance probability. Uh, am I using the right notation here? Well, anyway, I don't know if that's supposed to be a line or a semicolon. Uh, uh, alpha. Alpha. Well, anyway, yeah. So it's some function of X and uh, this. And then what you do is you accept the proposal uh, with probability alpha, right? You accept probability alpha, which means that, I'm using like semi-Python notation here, that you set x equal to w, otherwise you reject, else reject. If, if you reject, you don't really have to do anything because you just keep the old value of x. So basically, you generate a sample, you accept or reject. Generate a sample, accept or reject, right? Now, you have to pick uh, a proposal distribution and you also have to compute alpha. So now alpha in the, uh, in the Metropolis algorithm for Hastings Metropolis, um, or Hastings Metropolis. Oh, Metropolis. Or Hastings Metropolis. Basically what happens is that um, uh, you can pick Q to be how, pretty much whatever you want. You have to pick Q so that you can eventually get to every state. Otherwise, the Markov chain you generate is, is not irreducible. In other words, uh, remember, an irreducible Markov chain means that you can get to every state eventually. So uh, if, if, say, W, let's say you only had, uh, let's say your state transition probability was like this. You had, this is 0, 1, Two, right? And your proposal was uh, your proposal was that oh, if you're in two, you go to one, okay? And if you're one, you go to zero. And if you're zero, you go to zero. Well, okay, you can never get to state two because you're never proposing two. There's no mechanism to get to state two. So that's going to be a problem. So that you need to have, so that won't work. You need some kind of way of being able to get to state two. It has to be possible to get there. 
So you need that constraint. But otherwise, you can pretty much pick Q as you want, right? Then uh, the acceptance probability, now, but the thing is that if Q isn't symmetric, so if Q doesn't have the property under Metropolis, we have the property that Q of W X is equal to Q of X W, okay? You must have this. Okay, but we relax that constraint for Hastings Metropolis. That's what the Hastings means. It means that you don't enforce this constraint. So now you have a general Q. In that case, the form of alpha is more complicated. In that case, what ends up happening is alpha is, uh, let me write it in the simple form. This is uh, it's uh, uh, alpha of W X is equal to the minimum of one and you take Q of X W over uh, Q of W X times uh, now this thing here is uh, E to the minus uh, u of w minus u of x. So this thing here, oh, and that whole thing, oh, I kind of ran off the page. That's, that's the form of alpha. And that thing is delta u, right? It's the change in energy. So in the Metropolis algorithm, this would be one because these, Q function would be symmetric, so this would be one, and then it would just be, you'd accept with probability delta U, the E to the minus delta U, if U is positive, okay, if the energy increase, if the energy increases, if the energy decreases, then this value is gonna be greater than one, so you take the minimum of one, something greater than one, you get one, and then you just accept with probability one, okay? But this is the general term now, for the case when the Q isn't symmetric. So this is, um, uh, in this case, uh, this it compensates for the fact that you might be proposing some Ws more often than the others. So for example, if Q of W given X is larger than Q of X given W, then this ratio here will be less than one. So you'll tend to accept it less often, okay? And that makes sense because the problem is you're, you're unfairly uh, weighting transitions to W more heavily than you're weighting transitions from, w, from X to, I mean, from W, okay? So basically, uh, right, uh, maybe that makes sense. I think that hopefully makes sense. So if you had, a, if you had just a two-state Markov chain, this is zero and one, zero and one. If you were transitioning this way a lot, okay, so if you were proposing zeros from ones all the time, so this was like 0 0.9, but the, you, the probability of doing this would be 0 0.001, okay, well, you'd spend a lot more time proposing zeros so that it would bias the distribution and these would be out of balance. So, this term here corrects for that imbalance that may occur, right? All right, fine. So that's what that is. Then um, what happens is that, okay, now, so that's fine. So this is the Hastings Metropolis algorithm. Um, and this applies to 
pretty much anything. You can generate samples from any distribution. What ends up happening then is this thing here. So if you have these in time, uh, so you know if that was like a subroutine, then what ends up happening is that you have like x1 or let's say x0, and then you repeat this, right? So you then um, you have a, we'll call it, you know, uh, maybe there's a subroutine, Hastings underscore metropolis. And it takes in as input uh, x, k, and it generates an output x, k plus one. Yeah, we'll do this like this. Repeat, and then you initialize for uh, repeat for uh, k equals zero to. Uh, so I don't know, n, and you initialize this with x0 init, okay? So, okay. Now, this subroutine here you wrote, which is basically an implementation of once of, this, of these lines here. That subroutine, it gives an, it takes in an input x, it produces a new output x, but, uh, it generates random numbers inside of the routine because when you accept with probability alpha, the way you actually do that is you generate a random variable with this uniform with interval zero one, and you compare that random variable to, or you compare that random number to alpha. If it's less than alpha, you accept. If it's greater than alpha, you reject. Now, so so the output of this this um, function is actually random. It's not literally random, but it's pseudo-random because you generate a pseudo-random number inside of the subroutine that you use to determine what the output was going to be. Okay? So, so this thing is a Markov chain. So you have x0 goes to x1, goes to x2, goes to blah, blah, blah. So this is, this is a Markov chain. Okay, this is a Markov chain. Why? Because each new state only depends on the previous state in some random way. But it doesn't depend, by random way, it means that this function here has uh, some randomness to it. It's randomness to it because it's going to generate a uniformly distributed random variable in order to compare this alpha to it to decide whether to accept or reject. Oh, there's also this idea of generating the random proposal. There's randomness there too, okay? So when you write this routine, the output is, well, it's gonna be deterministic if you set the seed in the random number generator, but it's, it's sort of random, okay? It's pseudo-random. So each new uh, thing only depends on the previous one, but in distribution, and then it's a Markov chain. So now, and furthermore, it's the same subroutine you run every time, right? So therefore, the probability distribution for the transitions is the same every time you run this thing. It's not like there's a function here of k. It's not like the Hastings metropolis subroutine isn't a function of k. The only way k comes in is that the x is a function of k. So you give it a state, it gives you a new state. The output is random, but it depends on the old state. So that means it's a Markov chain and it must be homogeneous. It's homogeneous. And uh, furthermore then, you can show that since it's a homogeneous Markov chain, uh, and if it's irreducible and it's aperiodic and all those good things, then, uh, it, it, then, it's, it, then it's, then it's gotta be ergodic. And then the stationary distribution, how do you find the stationary distribution? You have to solve the full balance equations. But the full balance equations are hard to solve. In this particular case, the detailed balance equations also hold. Why? The detailed balance equations hold because um, 
because the thing is a reversible Markov chain. And then the proof that the detailed balance equations hold is where? Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that was the proof that uh, this is 38, 30, oh. This is 36 and 37. Okay, here's the proof. Um, uh, okay, well, okay, this is what you have to prove. You, those are the detailed balance equations. And, right, uh, well, anyway, proof is in here somewhere. Um, okay, anyway, so um, this is 34, 32, 33. Okay, this is the proof that I gave you that the Metropolis algorithm detailed balance equations hold. And somewhere here, oh, here's the proof. I knew it was here. 31. It's 36. Okay, here's the proof that it holds, the detailed balance equations hold. For the um, for the Hastings Metropolis case, it's on page one third the three thirty six, and um, yeah, the proof is a little bit technical because there's some special cases you have to take care of and make sure they're done right. But in the end, you get this: you get that the detailed balance equations hold. So then, since the detailed balance equations hold, detailed balance equations hold implies that the full balance equations hold implies that it's ergodic okay you need some other technical conditions to verify and uh but for the problems that we'll use they hold and then it's ergodic and then it's um so it has a stationary distribution and stationary distribution is going to be p of x equals this Okay, that's a Gibbs distribution. So, fine, so that's good. Now, uh, the problem is that, um, how do you apply this to a real plot problem? Because real problems, often the objects you're reconstructing are uh, high dimensional. Well, what you usually do is you only really uh, update, it's like a coordinate wise algorithm, you only update one pixel at a time. So. Uh, the easiest way to think about it is this. You have an image, okay, and your proposal distribution comes in two steps. First, you pick a, one of the pixels. And the simplest idea, and there's other things that work, okay, that are actually more commonly used. But the simplest idea conceptually is that you pick a pixel randomly. So by randomly, I mean uniformly distributed over all the pixels. So if there are uh, 1,000 by 1, uh, if there's 1K by 1K pixels, then there's going to be uh, one megapixels. So you pick uh, each pixel with a probability one over one mega, right? So you, you pick some pixel, you pick a, a pixel randomly. Then what you do is the next image you leave all the pixels the same except for that one that one pixel and you replace that one pixel with some probability distribution and i'm right uh so that when it, you say that xs or no okay ws this is proposed replacement for pixel s, okay, is distributed as, we'll say, um, you could eat, uh, uh, we'll say it's like g, I don't know, we'll make it q. Uh, I don't know, okay, q of w given, say, the neighbors of that pixel. So we'll say x of partial s. So this is neighbors of pixel S. So you take a little neighborhood here. Oops, 
it's actually the same here and there because they don't change. And you use those neighbors to pick uh, the distribution for the replacement pixel, okay? Then what you do, so that, that produces the new pixel. Then what you do is you can accept or reject. So you use the same formula to do the accept or reject. You use this formula. Now you have to interpret X and W here as being the entire image in both cases, but really only one pixel's changing. So for a lot of the forms that we typically have, it turns out there's only going to be dependencies in say those, those neighborhood, in that neighborhood, okay? So uh, that's what this thing is showing. So this is, you, you have to be careful about how you interpret these expressions. This, okay, I called that Q instead of G. So this is now uh, the probability of changing uh, the pixel at location SI to some value W sub SI, given that the entire rest of the image is XK, right? Okay, now, um, and uh, then, you, then you accept and reject pixels. So what ends up happening is you pick a pixel at random, you propose a change to the pixel, and then you accept or reject the pixel. Then you pick another pixel at random, and then you go through the same process. So you select the pixel, randomly, and then you replace it with a new value. You either accept or reject, a re okay, you pick a pixel randomly, you s generate a proposal for the replacement of the pixel, and then you accept or reject it. And you keep repeating that. That now generates a Markov chain of images. That I think is a little bit confusing to students. It seems kind of a little weird. I mean, because you think of, uh, of, a, of a Markov chain as being a Markov chain of states, but the state can be an image. Why not? I mean, an image is just a high dimensional object, right? So you pick some pixel here, you propose a change, you either accept or reject. You pick another pixel, you either accept or reject, right? Then you pick another pixel, you accept or reject. Then you take another pixel, you accept or reject, okay? And this generates a Markov chain of images. And that Markov chain, then, you, the idea is you prove this is an ergodic Markov chain. It's ergodic because it's, it's reversible, it meets the detailed balance equations, it meets the full balance equations. You have to prove that every pixel could change to any arbitrary value. Now, the probability might be very low, but it could happen. And then, uh, then, then you know the stationary distribution here is the desired distribution, okay? Okay, so that's how that works. And I think you implemented that. Now, one kind of interesting special case is, is this. If you have um, a distribution, P of X is equal to one over Z times E to the minus U of X, okay? So that's the distribution you're trying to generate samples from. Clearly, uh, let's say your proposal distribution, Q of W given X is equal to P of X. So in other words, you generate a proposal with the correct distribution, right? Then your hope would be that it accepts that change and you're done, right? So let's look at the formula. Well, hopefully this will work out. Uh, so let's see, the formula would be alpha of W given X is equal to the minimum of one and Q of W given X over Q of X given W, okay, times E to the minus U of W minus U of X. Okay, so this is delta, delta U. Okay, uh, all right. So uh, let's see. So then, then what happens is Q of W given X over Q of X given W. What is that? 
Well, uh, I'm saying that Q of W given X is P of X. So this is P of X. And, oh, hold on. This is supposed to be P of W, right? P of W, obviously, because the distribution is on W, not X. X is conditioning on it. So, uh, and then this thing here is P of X, right? But then this thing over here, this is E to the minus U of, uh, is it right? I hope I have this right. X. Oh, right, that's U of, did I write this wrong? I wrote this wrong. I transcribed it incorrectly. That's a W and that's an X. I'm sorry. This is W and that's X. Ah, I better just rewrite the whole thing. So P of X equals one over Z times E to the minus U of X. This is Q of W given X equals P of W, because I'm making exactly the same mistakes that students make, which is bad, because I'm going to reinforce your errors. This is the minimum of one. I can't believe I transcribed that incorrectly. Okay, so this is the formula here. It's Q of X given W over Q of W given X, and this is E to the minus U of W minus U of X. And this thing is Delta U like that, okay? So now what happens is that um, uh, Q of X given W over Q of W given X, that's equal to P of X over P of W, right? Because that's what this formula here is. And this thing here, um, E to the minus U of W, minus u of x, right? That's equal to e to the minus u of w over e to the minus u of x, right? But I could divide both of these by z. That doesn't change anything, correct? So this thing here is p of w over p of x. So, so we have that this entire quantity here is um, this whole thing here. That whole thing is P of X over P of W times P of W over P of X equals one. Huh. So, so the conclusion is that alpha of W given X equals what? It equals one. Well, that makes sense. Thank goodness it's true. Because if we pick, if, if someone comes and gives us the answer to our problem, if we generate a random variable with the correct distribution, we definitely don't want to reject it. So if we accept it with probability one, now we're guaranteed we're, we're done. Of course, that's not a case that really comes up very often because why would you be doing this in the first place if you could generate samples from the distribution? But if that happened, you want to make sure you accepted it. So somebody comes and gives you a million dollars, you don't want to turn them down. You want to say, oh yes, thank you very much. They generated the sample with the correct distribution. I'll just accept it and I'm done. Okay. Now, um, okay. So you'd say, well, why did I do that case? Well, because the next problem I want to do is kind of closely related. It's this so-called Gibbs sampler, okay? In the Gibbs sampler, the idea is this. 
It's a very clever idea, actually. That you have, um, you have a bunch of, you have an image, okay? So you're going to generate a sequence of images. And the sequence of images is a Markov chain, right? In time. So again, it's a little counterintuitive because it's a little bit counterintuitive for the actual state of the Markov chain to itself be an image. But this, you know, the state of the Markov chain could be anything. Why not? It can be an image. Maybe it's a volume. Maybe it's a, the state of the universe. I don't know. It could be anything. So, so it's like, this is a Markov chain. Now, to generate the next sample, right? To generate this next sample, you randomly pick a pixel. Okay, so let's say that's my random pixel. And you generate the sample. You generate a sample for the distribution of the next pixel, okay? So the way I'm gonna generate that is that I'm gonna have the W, S, because now it's the s -th pixel in the image I'm replacing. WS is gonna be distributed as what? Well, that'll be my proposal distribution. It'll be QS of WS given X, okay? Right, X is the full image. And this is a single pixel. Right? So I'm looking at the entire image and I'm replacing a, a single pixel. Now, what distribution do you think would be good to use for the distribution of that replacement pixel given the full image? Are there any answers to this question? What would be a good choice for the distribution of that pixel given the entire rest of the image? Some, and remember, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, some linear combination of the neighborhood pixels. Well, yes, that's a good idea. But remember, we can do something even better than that. Because remember, we know the probability distribution. This is, well, we don't know the probability distribution, but this is the desired distribution, okay? So if that's the desired distribution, let me put it this way, Yash. Imagine that this whole image here already is from the correct distribution, that, that an oracle came and gave you a sample, a, a random sample from the correct distribution, okay? If you didn't want to screw it up, what distribution would you want that pixel to have given all the rest of the pixels? If you didn't want to screw it up, Right? So let's, 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 let's just roll back our thinking on this, okay? Let's just like forget everything we know because everything we know is too complicated. And let's just think about this problem at an intuitive level. You have this, pro you have this X, this is X zero, right? Imagine an oracle comes and gives you an image with the correct distribution. A random, it, your oracle generates an image from the sample distribution P of X that you wanted, okay? So you get a sample, you get a random sample from that distribution, okay? Now you wanna replace one of the pixels and you wanna maintain the correct distribution. So you don't wanna screw it up. Do you see what I'm saying by not wanting to screw it up? Does that make sense? Yes. Right, because you could screw it up. You could put a random variable in that. You could replace that pixel with something that's from the wrong distribution, right? Like what if you just made it zero all the time? Then that wasn't the distribution, presumably, of P of X. So you could screw it up, right? It's possible to screw it up, isn't that correct? Mm, do people catch what I'm saying here? Yes, if you mess with that pixel, you can screw up the distribution. You could screw up the distribution, right? It's possible. So once you accept the idea that you can screw up the distribution, then it raises the question, well, what could I do that 
doesn't screw up the distribution? What would not screw up the distribution? Doing nothing. Uh, that's true. <laughs> That's a good point, actually. You got me on that one. Doing nothing would be correct, okay? And if I did nothing, by the way, what would be the distribution of that pixel given all the other pixels? Does okay. the impulse at, at the original? Excuse me? Does the impulse at the original pixel value? Well, yeah, okay, this comes down to this point of like, what is a real random variable versus a random number and so Yeah, your answer is sort of correct. Uh, it's not the answer I'm looking for. Um, it comes down to this issue of the confusion between what they mean when they say a realization or a random variable. And, okay, so um, let's assume, let's pick the current pixel value and pick a Gaussian around that. Is that what you're looking for? And you're kind of on the right track, okay? Let, let me, like, I'm going to keep this. By the way, what I'm talking about here is actually important. It's important because it really cuts to the core of understanding what we're doing, okay? I'm going to zoom in. This is the whole image, right? Okay? The problem is, part of the problem here is that, and that's the pixel, right? Part of the problem is that you can't really draw a random image, right? Because if you draw it, it's not random anymore. I mean, this comes back to the problem that random variables are neither random nor variables, okay? That you can't really, I can't write down a random variable. I mean, if I say, well, three, well, three's not random anymore. It's deterministic, right? Because with probability one, it's three. So I can't draw a random variable. I can't, I can draw the distribution of a random variable, right? So that's why we always talk about realizations of random variables. That's kind of Weasley language for not really being very precise. I mean, it doesn't, the concept of realization of random variable really doesn't have a, a totally precise meaning, okay? But we talk about it because it's sort of like the outcome of the random experiment, okay? Uh, but so once I generate an image, it's a specific value. It's sort of not random anymore, okay? But if I actually think of this thing as being a random image, like it, it's, it's actually random. So I have x0, it's not a specific value. It's the random image, okay? If that random image is from the correct distribution, I guess one way of thinking about it would be that maybe this is a program that generates an x as opposed to actually a specific x. So it's a program that if I call the program, it generates an x, a random image with the correct distribution, right? Now, if I replace, if I put a different random variable in there, I may not have the correct distribution anymore. What's the distribution of that pixel supposed to be given all the rest of the image? I'm almost giving you the answer, by the way, okay? So I feel like by making, this is like, if somebody doesn't speak English, you must speak louder because then it would be easier for them to translate. It doesn't make any sense, it's silly. It's like if I make the picture bigger, somehow it makes it easier to understand. But I'm gonna make it bigger anyway because it makes me feel good. So you replace this pixel with a new pixel, right? What should the distribution of that pixel be? The answer is so painfully obvious that you can't figure it out. I'm asking, this is one of those really penetratingly simple questions, okay? That's so fundamental that it's hard to think about. Okay, I'll make it even simpler. We have two random variables, x and y. Two, just two random variables, right? Okay. Now, if I want to produce a new x and y, so I want to produce x prime and y, so this is a new random variable. What's the distribution of x prime got to be in order for this to maintain the same joint distribution? P of x? Almost, very close, 
but wrong. He's X and Y. Yes, X prime has got to be distributed as P of X given Y, right? Does that make sense? Let's think about that. It's such a simple idea and it's such a powerful idea, right? So this thing had some joint distribution. The joint distribution was P of X, Y. Right? And if I just put a new random variable in there with some other crazy distribution, it won't be the same joint distribution anymore. A simple example would be, let's say these were two, um, let's say they were two Gaussian random variables, which were zero mean and correlation one half, okay? If I just put a Gaussian, an independent Gaussian random variable in there with zero mean, so, so let's say that these, um, this was like normal with mean zero and covariance R, where R is equal to one, one, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. That's a legitimate autocorrelation, right? It's uh, the two random variables are both Gaussian zero mean random variables and their correlation is 50%, okay? Everybody's, believes that that's a legitimate distribution for, okay? Is everybody, someone make me feel good by saying yes. Yes. Yep. Okay, now let's say I just put an independent random variable in here that was uncorrelated with that Y. Would it still have the same distribution? Would the pair still have the same joint distribution if I just threw some other, let's say I put a random variable no. in there that's Poisson, okay? Would it still have the same joint distribution? No. No, right? I mean, it's not like I can just put any random variable in there and the distribution is correct, right? I just want everybody to really be clear on this idea that it's possible to screw this up, that in fact, it's tricky to do it right. If you're going to put a new random variable there, that the random variable has to be have the correct distribution. Uh, maybe there's an even more fundamental point. Okay, if I have x and x is distributed as n zero one. Okay, right. I generate a new random variable x prime, and it's n zero one. Are those the same random variables necessarily? Now I've gotten down to something really simple. When you get to something really simple and you're not sure what the answer is, you know you got problems, okay? So, okay, first of all, you understand that you can have a thing called a Gaussian random variable, correct? Mm -hmm. Everybody feels comfortable with that. Its mean is zero and its variance is one, right? Yeah. Okay, now you got a second Gaussian random variable. Its mean is zero and its variance is one, right? Mm -hmm. Are these two the same? No. They don't Not have to be. They can be, but do they have to be the same? No, they don't have to be the same. As a matter of fact, most of, a lot of the things we do always start off by saying, choose XN, I, I, D, N, zero, one, right? By I, I, D, what I'm presuming is that it's possible to send, generate an infinite number of independent random variables with the same distribution, right? So it's certainly possible to have two random variables with the same distribution that are independent, right? Is everybody good with this? I just want to check. Yes. Okay. So my point is this, just because, and now, so it is possible to generate a new random variable with the same distribution, correct? And in particular, it's possible to generate a new random variable with the same distribution that's independent. It doesn't have to be independent. These two random variables could be correlated and still have the same distribution, right? I just want to make sure, this, are people comfortable with this? Mm -hmm. So I'm asking a slightly more complicated question. If I have a pair of random variables with some joint distribution, 
and I want to generate a new pair where x is different than this x. So x prime and x are not the same random variable. Y and these two y's are the same random variable, but the x's are different. But I want the new random variable to have the same joint distribution with y. How do I do it? Well, I, I have to sample, I have to, this x prime has to come from the conditional distribution of x given y. Is anybody there? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, right. So here's the I here's the key idea. If I do this, if I do, if I keep taking, if I do this, if I take, so I have x y. So I have x y x, y, I replace, so let's, I'll call this 0, 0, 1, uh, so I'll make that 0. So this is x1, x1, x1 is, is chosen from the distribution of x given y, right? And then, then y1 is, is taken from the distribution of y given x, right? And then and x2 is taken from the distribution of x given y. Do you see what I'm doing here? And then I keep repeating this running out of paper like that okay do you see what i'm doing here i have these pair of pixels i replace one pixel from the with a new random variable where it's taken chosen from the conditional distribution of x given y then i replace y with a random variable which is generated with the conditional distribution of y given x and then i go back and replace x with something which is chosen from the conditional distribution of x given y. So every time I'm replacing the pixel with a new random variable that is the same distribution given the other random variables, given the other pixels. You know, I kind of, I watched over the weekend a movie called The World's End. Has anybody ever watched that? It's with, does anybody know who um, Sean Pegg is. Gosh, don't you guys follow popular culture at all? I'm really shocked. Nobody's ever heard of Sean Pegg. Okay. He like, he made a triad of movies, The Shaun of the Dead. Has anybody ever seen that? It's a zombie movie. Yeah, I've heard of that one. Yeah, The Shaun of the Dead. Well, there was a triad. It was Hot Fuzz, the Shaun of the Dead and The World's End, okay? And you should watch it because he saves the world at the end by being so stupid that the aliens no longer want to take over the earth, okay? So, because they figure it's pointless because if most people are as dumb as he is, you just, why would you want to bother, okay? So the point is this, that in the movie, the various people keep getting replaced with aliens, okay? So the new aliens are like new people, but they look the same <laughs> and they have the same distribution. That's what we're doing. Where it's like we're replacing the random variable with the new, like they call them, uh, what did they call them in the Shaun of the Dead? Oh no, it was uh, the, the, world, the World's End. It, it was, uh, they replaced, uh, I can't remember what they called them. They had a name for it, but it was a good name. So you basically take the random variable, you replace, Try to get this is such a simple idea. You have two random variables, x and y. You take this random variable, you replace it with a new random variable that has the correct distribution given y. 
Then you replace y with a random variable that has the correct distribution given x. And then you give it more x with the, the, and you do this, okay? It's like you're replacing the random variables with new random variables that have the correct distribution. It's like the zombie replacements, okay? That look like the same people, but they're not the same people, okay? It's a new random variable, but it's got the same distribution. See, that's the key idea. So that's why at the very beginning I said, there is a distinction between a distribution and a random variable. They are not the same thing. The distribution is a property of the random variable, but it isn't the random variable, okay? So you can have two different random variables that have the same distribution, but are different random variables, right? So every time you replace this, you replace that, you replace it with a new random variable that has the correct distribution, but it's a new random variable, okay? If you keep doing that, if you keep replacing the, these pixels with the pixel that has the correct distribution given the other pixel, what do you think is going to happen? Let's say you start off, you init. X, Y goes to zero, zero. You initialize them both with zero. So they start off, they're definitely not the correct distribution because you've set them to the zero, zero. But you keep replacing X with the correct distribution and Y, right? And X and Y and X and Y and X and Y and X and Y because you have a joint distribution, P of X, Y. From P of X, Y, you can compute P of x given y and you can compute p of y given x. If I keep replacing them with the sand, with new random variables that have the correct distribution, what's eventually going to happen? If there's any justice in the world. You'll have the correct distribution. Exactly! <laughs> right? It's kind of, when you really think about it, it's kind of obvious, right? It, it's like you keep fixing it. It's like you're solving some kind of crazy jigsaw puzzle. You go, oh, you do this right. Oh, that's wrong. Fix that one. Oh, no. Oh, fix this one. Fix this one. Fix this one. Fix this one. Fix this. If you keep fixing them and you do it forever, what's going to eventually happen? It'll be correct. That would be what you would hope, right? Mm. Do, do you understand what I'm saying here? Yeah. I have a question, though. Yes. Does, do you have to fix it in? order can i fix x twice rather than fixing x then y so like okay. if i have three variables in yeah so to... let's say i have three variables very good question so you got this right i just yeah. this is the simple idea once you have this you basically have the whole idea okay mm -hmm. oh let me say one thing before i answer your question which this is a gibbs sampler That's all a Gibbs sampler is. A Gibbs sampler just replaces, if you keep going replacing with the correct distribution for every pixel, and you just keep going around, do, 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 you pick a pixel at random, replace it with the right thing, okay? You just keep doing it, that's a Gibbs sampler. That is a Gibbs sampler, and guess what? You can prove that the accepted, that ex exib sampler is exactly the Hastings Metropolis algorithm, and if you calculate alpha, it comes out to be one. Why does it alpha come out to be one? I'll come back to your question, Alessandro. The reason it comes back to be one is because this calculation I did here, that here, is exactly the same calculation. Everything cancels out, and the acceptance probability is one. So in other words, if you generate a random variable with the correct distribution, it turns out that the acceptance probability is one. And if the acceptance probability, that means you generate a random variable with the character distribution, you accept it. You generate, accept, generate, accept, generate, accept. Just skip the accept, because you always accept. You generate, 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 generate. You just keep going back and forth. Eventually, now you've proven, you say, well, why do you care? Well, you care because now you've proven, ah, it's the it's a special case of the Hastings Metropolis algorithm. We know that the Hastings Metropolis algorithm generates a reversible 
Markov chain. It's reversible, so therefore it, it's, it meets the ergodicity conditions. And its stationary distribution is the desired stationary distribution. Because, oh, now the, 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 oh, the, de the detailed balance equations hold trivially. Let me, oh, I'll come back to your comment, Alessandra, but I just got to show you this. The detailed balance uh, uh, hold trivially. You have X and Y like that, right? Because now you have, okay, P of X, Y, that's your joint distribution, and that times uh, the probability of, of, uh, of X given Y, right? And, and the question is, is that equal to uh, P of X, Y times the probability of Y given X. Right. Uh, you know, X given, you know, Y given X. So this thing here is, okay, it works. Oh gosh. Uh, yeah, it's, okay, I'm not even going to try to prove it. I'm just going to get confused, but it kind of makes sense. It works. So let me answer Alessandra's question. If you have three, X, Y, and Z, right? Now what happens is now it just becomes a little more complicated. Instead of having two, you pick one of the two, one of the three randomly, or you can go in, in, in a cycle, one, two, three, one, two, three, okay? It doesn't matter as long as you hit them all. And then what happens is that now you, you, you replace it with, this is X, Y, Z. This you replace with the probability of X given Y and Z. Then you, you have X, Y, Z. And this is the probability of Y given X and Z, okay? And then you have X, Y, Z. And this is the probability of uh, Z given X and Y. And then X, Y, Z. And now you can start again. Probability of X given Y and Z, right? Does that, did that answer your question, Alejandro? Um, in Instead of in that order, can I, do I have to iterate every position before moving on? No. To the iteration? You or could go here, you could go here. You can do any order is, okay, you can do any order. The order can either be stochastic or, or um, random. Mm -hmm. As long as, uh, as time goes to infinity, you hit each point an infinite number of times. Okay. So you could do one, two, three, one, one, two, three, one, 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 two, three, one, 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 two, three. You see what I'm saying? Because it's still the case that you will hit Y an infinite number of times. Okay. Pretty much, here's would not here's what would not work. One, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Because you never get to Z, right? I mean, that doesn't make any sense. Or if you go one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two one, forever, right? The fact that you hit Z once, of course, that's not good enough. The fact that you hit Z just a finite number of times is not good enough. You have to hit Z an infinite number of times. Okay. It's, it's actually pretty reasonable. I mean, the proof can get technically complex because now it's not a homogeneous Markov chain, which is actually why this section of the notes is long, because if you read it in detail, it gives, it explains how you can prove the case. The easiest case is when you do randomized selection, because then every step is, is the same probability uh, transition. So it's a homogeneous Markov chain. If it's not a homo if you do, if you do them in order, then if there's a cycle, then what ends up happening is the transition probability from the from one full cycle of updates is a homogeneous Markov chain. Did that make sense? Mm -hmm. 
Right. So, but the key idea is you got the, the key idea of what a Gibbs sampler is. A Gibbs sampler is so obvious. You just replace every random variable with the, you fix each random variable so it's got the correct distribution given its, uh, its neighbors. And you do that enough times, eventually you'll converge, okay? Because it turns out it's an ergot of Markov chain and it can be viewed as just imply, uh, implementing the Hastings Metropolis algorithm. I think we're out of time now. Hopefully you learned something. Let me uh, put the, I'll stop the uh, recording. Uh...